Uh, thank you, Sham. And uh, now Jeff Klan is going to come and tell us uh, about some exciting work in data quality. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about data quality. And um, I'm Jeff. And that is my attempt to reconstitute the people who, the list of people who are working on this um, with me. And I'm sure I probably missed someone. So if I did, let me know. I would love to add you to the slide. Um, I also realized that I forgot to put in kind of a 10,000 foot view of why we care about data quality. So I'm going to do something that I've always wanted to do, which is just talk while I'm on the title slide for a while. So data quality is a huge issue that needs to be addressed when you're dealing with EHR data, and especially when you're linking EHR data together across a lot of sites, um, because different sites use different coding systems, different coding practices. One site might use a specific code for LOINC that, um, because the LOINC lab ontology has many codes that are very similar, but have slightly different collection methods. So if you, uh, if you use a slightly different uh, method of getting a patient's blood, then you have a different LOINC code. And so harmonizing all of these things is like the, the prerequisite to data quality. And that, that is done in an act by the ontology, which provides a layout of all of the different terms that are supported in an act, groups them into folders so you can choose uh, you know, like a liver function test panel rather than a specific method of, of gathering an ALT or something from a patient. So, so that, that gets us pretty far in data quality, but there's still the problem where coding systems might be different. You might not have all of your data harmonized correctly into the ENACT ontology. You might be missing swaths of data. There are actually a large number of problems that are just technical problems and getting the data transferred to your data warehouse. And, and we, we track, we, one of the things we're gonna show is that we want to track across refreshes because in other networks I've been involved in, I've seen like a refresh occur where suddenly a site has no more procedure codes. And it was, it was just a the difference in how it was being loaded by their um, load process. And it just caused a lot of issues. Uh, so there's, there's coding systems, there's uh, ETL, data loading problems. Uh, there is um, uh, there's the problem of not having patient patients with complete data uh, because a patient might go to a different hospital system for their specialty care and you might just not have any of their data for their treatment of uh, diabetes or something of that nature. So so there are all these issues that crop up with EHR data specifically that you don't see so much. I think I I, I feel like you don't see these as much with if you're collecting something that's more universally gathered, like if you have everyone with the same um, assay of genomics, uh, EHR data is so highly variable. So ENACT, one of the kind of core goals of ENACT is to improve um, data quality for the use in federated research networks. ENACT first and foremost, but other networks as well. So the, the thing that we're working on now, and this is our major push um, and it will continue to be our major push going into next year, is a patient counting analytics and visualization pipeline. So I'm going to talk about that for the majority of the talk. I'm also going to talk about loyalty cohorts. This is something that Sean and uh, Griffin, I believe, mentioned earlier today. I think Sean mentioned it as well, to ensure patients that have complete data. And then uh, just very briefly, I'll talk about computational phenotyping with algorithms like Kesser and Comap and Phenorm, which is probably the next step. And at the end, um, the, the thing that we all want to get to is doing something useful with natural language processing and large language models and digital twin dashboards. Um, so today we're kind of here. We're rolling out the patient counting. Um, we're enhancing the tools for using it. Uh, and we're, we're, we've piloted the loyalty cohort we're kind of starting a pilot of the computational phenotyping at a couple of sites, um, looking for more sites to join. If anyone would like to, uh, let me know. There are also data quality methods, not to you know, say we're just starting on data quality now. There's been data quality things going on besides just the ontology for many years in the ACT network. Um, there's the smoke test that Sean mentioned. There's also an additional suite of data quality queries that uh, 
I think Michelle runs manually every now and again um, to get some impressions of data quality in the network. And you can automate some of this by creating um, custom, uh, custom SQL breakdowns in I2B2, which is a really neat feature that um, most people don't know about. <laughs> so uh, maybe we can talk about that at some point, but not in this talk. So the patient counting analytics pipeline. Um, the ITP2 ontology, again, groups things into folders. As you go down in the folders, you get to more and more specific codes. Um, I2P2 has had this data field since like 2007 for storing a number associated with each, uh, with each element of the ontology. And that number is used usually for the number of patients in the data warehouse that have that piece of information. So here we have about 45,000 patients who have a medication we have uh, about 5,000 that, that have been prescribed an angiotensin II inhibitor. Um, so just by counting all these things and counting them at all of the sites in the ACT network, we can start to look at what's different across sites. Um, where do you have like a dramatically fewer number of patients with hypertension than another site? Uh, or, or did you lose all your procedures in this data load versus your last data load? And where in the granularity is the problem? Like maybe a lot of patients have um, ACE inhibitors, but maybe they don't, there's no one with a specific ACE inhibitor that you're interested in researching. So how, how do we deal with that? Well, this is, this, is, this is as close as I'm getting to math in this presentation. <laughs> so if you, if you take the, I, I think the 661,000 concepts in the ontology tree. I think that doesn't include the entire ENACT ontology tree. That is the number of concepts that I've seen actually used in the data from the 17 sites that we have data from. Uh, so you have about 661,000 different things. Um, you have millions of patients that you're collecting data across many sites. And you can do this at you know, perhaps all 40 sites in the network. And from that, you can create a data quality dashboard. And the, the dashboard is the thing we've been putting a lot of effort into recently. So there are, are tools that uh, Dave Wang has developed that I'll, I'll show some screenshots of to find, uh, find places in your ontology tree where the counts that you have are very different than uh, other sites. It also has the nice side effect of being able to browse the averages in the network so you can kind of see what the, the shape of, of the ENACT network is and what, I guess, a third of the US population looks like. Um, and, and we can look at what's missing, we can look at trends across refreshes, and we can look at variations in mapping choices. So this is the simplified, simplified version of a diagram that we've been working on in the data quality work group for what this pipeline looks like. I'm gonna go through it at a very high level. So there's this component where a local site does some work in order to participate in this. They run a stored procedure uh, that will do all this patient counting for them. Uh, in I2B2 1.8, we hope to automate this with a scheduler component that Mike Mendez is, is writing so that this can maybe happen automatically when you update your data. Um, and then they take that CSV file and if they choose to, they, um, put it in a secure location that the Shrine team has set up for us. And all of those files are then grabbed by a Python script, put into a database, compute a bunch of statistics on it, and um, do some magic there. That, get, that Those network statistics, the averages and, uh, and the, the standard deviations get fed into uh, a data quality explorer tool that is going to be available on the web um, within, within the ENACT, with, with some type of security, so only ENACT users can get to it. But, um, but the local data, the data that you actually might be concerned has some level of uh, privacy issues around it, those counts with all of your individual accounts for all of your data types, those stay with you. And you did send them off to Harvard to get this network statistics file and be part of that, but it never is available on the web. 
you, you have to load that file manually into the Data Quality Explorer. So we spent a lot of time going around about that, trying to figure out how to design a workflow that didn't cause people to lose their hair. Um, there's also a separate dashboard that we had a, uh, <clears throat> we had an intern write over the summer. He did some really cool stuff with uh, our shiny dashboards to look at kind of higher level statistics uh, across the whole network. So I'll, I'll show a little of all of these. Uh, this is the data quality explorer that uh, we're, we're about to roll out. So you can see from this, you can browse the ontology tree. Uh, this is browsing the COVID hierarchy. And uh, the node that is clicked is coronavirus infection unspecified, B34.2. So that is one of the uh, diagnosis codes that we put into the COVID ontology that's relevant for COVID research. And um, the reason it's clicked is because here, this site has many more COVID cases than on average. You can see the percentage is, uh, well, yeah, the percentage is 7%, or no, maybe the percentage is 0.07%. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, if you look in the, uh, in, the, in the center there, you can see that the mean is some value less than that, and the X, little, little oh, I'll point here, <laughs> you can't see that, but the little X at the top is where your site lands. So it's more than two standard deviations above the average. So you have more, more patients with this particular diagnosis of COVID. That might not be a data quality problem, but it could be. Maybe your coding practices are different. Maybe you're using B34.2 when other people are using uh, like unspecified pneumonia more frequently. Um, yeah, and, uh, and with this, you can quickly kind of pinpoint those spots where things are just a little bit different than average. Uh, there's also this, uh, this cool sum tree view that, that's some work that uh, Griffin Weber was leading, um, uh, came up with a few years ago, uh, where it kind of, it summarizes the entire tree. So the, those boxes you see on that diagram uh, show you the number of outliers at each level of the, of the top level tree. So in that COVID hierarchy, the first level has five outliers, the second level has 25 outliers, the next level has 568 outliers, and so on and so forth. And when you click on one of those levels, it expands the kind of the pathway to get to that point in the tree. And the colors tell you which ones are outliers and which one, so which ones are high outliers, which ones are low outliers. And um, so, so we're, we're trying to develop these motifs for navigating these 600,000 terms in a, in a reasonable, reasonably fast way. Um, and and this, is, this is an interesting real world example at a site that is uh, in the Sun Belt, um, they actually have a much higher incidence of skin cancer than other sites. And this shows up right in the Data Quality Explorer. It is highlighted as a outlier in the ICD-10 tree. And then as you drill down in the lower levels, you see that the children of melanoma and other malignant neoplasms of the skin is also, they are all also outliers at this site. Um, the, the other, the R shiny stuff that we are, we want to integrate this, this coming year into our reports, uh, give you a view across sites. So the, the idea for this is probably that this would be used by um, site administrators and maybe network administrators, and it wouldn't be something that researchers or even your average data scientist would be using. Um, so what you're seeing is the different sites, which are anonymized here, had different quantities of patients with a diagnosis in the ICD-10 tree at different points in time when we collected the data from them. And what you would hope to see is that you'd see kind of a, an increase, maybe a fairly uh, constant increase in time uh, as you go forward, because one might expect you to have more patients with a disease today than you did in your hospital system five years ago. 
you would not expect to have less. The reason for that is not that you're only gaining patients in your hospital system, but when you refresh your data, you have all the historical data as well. So whatever you had in 2005 would be additive to what you have in 2023. Um, and, and so if you see a drop, then something bad has probably happened on a technical side where your data is just not coming across anymore. Or maybe your coding system's changed or um, you have a different process in place. Uh, you can also look at this in a different way by just looking at the very highest level, like which trees uh, in the ACT ontology uh, were missing data at the different sites at a particular point in time or a range of points in time. So you can see uh, site D didn't have any medications, um, probably an issue. You can also, you can also see um, only one site had social determinants of health, and that's because that's only recently been rolled out, and that's probably not a problem. But that's the kind of, kind of really high level of view that a network administrator might be interested in to then contact sites and say, hey, we're, we're missing some things at a pretty high level. Um, you, can, you can also do the same type of thing that the Data Quality Explorer lets you do in a dashboard where you can drill down and look at the, um, the prevalence differences across sites. Um, a, ni a nice feature that we want to integrate back into the Data Quality Explorer as well is that um, you know, with, with these tools, you can look at this high level information, patient counts, but you actually have, if you're a site admin, you actually have an ITB2 instance. And there's a lot more information in your I2B2 instance than we can show here. So people will want to take their uh, data quality problems that they found and take a look back at their I2B2 and try to find the source of those problems. So there, we actually have, have worked on some tools to generate SQL queries. Uh, so when you see something that has an issue, you can click SQL queries are generated and it helps you get uh, it's just a, a real quick tool to get that data out that you run manually at your site for yourself um, to find more information. So we've, we've actually, we did a pilot of the, this data collection before we had any good dashboards a, a couple of years ago. And we got uh, a bunch of sites, which you can see on the left list. And um, we've recently collected data from a bunch of sites that you can see on the right list. And in total, some are duplicated, so there's more bullets here, but we have 17 sites data, which is less than the whole network, but it's actually a pretty good swath of the network for an initial rollout. And we will be providing um, tools back to them pretty soon. Uh, so the next step, oh, I've been talking for a rather long time. Hmm. Five minutes? All right. I guess I had a lot to say on data quality. So, so briefly, and I can maybe I'll skip this pretty fast because uh, Sean uh, talked about it earlier today. But another important thing in data quality is to find the patients that have complete data. Uh, so, how how do you know that your patient doesn't have complete data? You're not going to see the diagnosis of uh, uh, I don't know lupus uh, in their medical record because maybe they don't have a primary care at this hospital and they certainly don't see their lupus specialist. Uh, so how do you figure out the patient is missing data? Well, um, there are some ideas on how to, how to do that. Um, and that the, the, the method of doing that is called finding a loyalty cohort. So we recently uh, put out a paper that used a previously validated uh, set of 20 variables that had been shown in a different study to, um, that was not really a die to be to, to uh, be pretty good correlates of patients that uh, have complete data. And th that was things like um, the pa patient needs to have at least two diagnoses of any kind and at least three visits and uh, at least, uh, you know, one repeat visit with the same provider and uh, things like that. And um, we took that and did uh, a, a lasso regression on that. And we mapped it all to I2V2 and the ACT ontology, do a lasso regression at the local site and find coefficients to detect patients that maximize the score. So the patients get 
components of a score for having all of these things. And the patients with a score above some threshold um, are considered loyal, and you can do some validation on how the sensitivity and specificity. And we got um, AUCs of about 0.81 on average across our sites. So it's not perfect, but it does enhance the cohort. It does give you a much higher probability that you are collecting complete data, data on complete, complete data from patients. You might be missing some patients, but uh, we, we found that, the, the, uh, that we were able to get pretty good, is that sensitivity? Um, so these are some of the variables, and I don't have the actual uh, text of what that, these mean, but you can see like three visits with the same provider, mammographies, PSAs, things that th th these are slightly skewed toward older people, but things that people do routinely and regularly get, and um, regular visits, regular diagnoses, things like that. So very, very quickly, computational phenotyping. Uh, lots of math, and then you get um, a model that lets you find, figure out what features a patient needs to have at what frequency uh, to have a curated list of patients that really actually have a phenotype. And it involves uh, things like knowledge graphs to do feature selection. It involves uh, regressions and phenotyping models and lots of data tables. And at the end of the day, you get a curated phenotype library that has some known performance metrics and can tell you uh, what patients have what disease. And then um, NLP, LLMs, digital twins. So you can take all this stuff and then put it into a dashboard that lets you view a patient as kind of a digital twin. You can do natural language processing. We want to do this in NACT also, as Sham had mentioned. And, um, and, and find, find structured entities inside textual data. Uh, you can do things with large language models. Um, Mike Mendez and Sean are going to uh, show something that this is not a very good representation of it, but you can actually generate I2B2 queries uh, through uh, large language models. Um, a, a different thing we were chatting about yesterday is um, what, what data quality problems can you find by providing a list of obfuscated and obscure, uh, obfuscated and anonymized counts to chat GPT and then say, well, what sorts of things uh, pop out? And it, you know, it was able to find like the, the outliers and the, and the differences, which is similar to, but not as advanced as the stuff Zach was showing this morning. Uh, so download some tools and tell us what's wrong with them. The, the, the total, the patient counting thing is pretty honed. I think that's ready for prime time. Loyalty cohort's been tested quite extensively as well, and more is coming soon. So thanks. Thank you for your great talk. So I have two questions. First, for data harmonization, evaluation, kind of algorithms like uh, many for the learning be integrated into the system to deal with the missing data or outliers. And second question, when query and select uh, data with outliers, can uh, a high dimensional map be provided, like a UMAP or TSNI map, so users can select uh, uh, data sets from multi-dimensional perspective. I don't think I caught all that. Anyone? No? Okay. So I think the first question was about um, missing data and providing information to the users on missing data. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the the tools that we're creating are going to be available to users, uh, and sites can determine what users they want to make. Uh, make available to whom, um, so that sites can can find that missing data. And we're also thinking about generating like a text report of the top things that seem to be missing in the data set. Um, and the second question, I don't think I know what those those things are. A TP map and yeah, TCN map or U map, a high dimensional to low dimensional selection. So yeah. we can use a, a graphic interface to use that can select data sets easily or a multi-dimensional, like a reader map. Oh, OK. All right. That's, that's very interesting stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll want to chat. Maybe we can chat offline about doing that kind of thing. Thank you.
Thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Sean. Okay.